May you find sanctuary among trees and stones and feel earth preparing a place for you to sit and breathe and be. Let the long limbs of branches form a canopy above your head. Let the hills open up a place for you to soar. May the stones form an altar and see how the sun makes everything shimmer and glisten so that everything shines forth from within. Let the tender vine climbing the trunk show you what it is to reach to the sky. Let all the living creatures that gather, winged and four-footed ones, offer a new companionship. All around you, see yourself as part of this glorious cathedral. The lake and holy wells are the fonts of baptism. The river rushes carrying gifts down from the mountains. The oaks and sycamore create a sacred circle. The face of the creator incarnate and imminent illuminated with each gaze. Feel the veil between heaven and earth slip away until you know the sanctuary of soil and sunlight. Listen to the sky whisper her secrets on the wind, lifted by wings and song. As we acknowledge the land this morning, let's be mindful of our place amidst the glorious cathedral of creation. I invite you to slow down for a moment with me, maybe closing your eyes and letting your attention ground here in this moment. You can feel your breath and feel how gravity anchors you here. And we feel the earth and how it holds us, supports us, and we recognize that indigenous peoples served as keepers of this land thousands of years before European settlers came and began claiming it. Indigenous peoples continue to care for the land, serving as stewards, even as the momentum of colonization plows onward. Let us be mindful of these realities in letting them inform our actions with truth. We're hosted on the lands of the Mississaugas of the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Wendat. We also recognize the enduring presence of all First Nations, Métis, and Inuit peoples. We honor the light of creation alive in their hearts, and we acknowledge some of the ways that we have tried to limit or suppress their light, their rights, and their lives. The light of Christ calls us to love one another, allowing space for one another to walk our paths. And moving gently with the Spirit, let's follow in the way of Jesus, the peacemaker. And that light of welcome extends to all of you. On this Labor Day weekend, we hold space to gather as a community wherever we find ourselves. And so I'm grateful that you're part of this community, whether you're visiting for the first time or have been with us for generations. You are part of a community that doesn't think the same, love the same, or vote the same. And when we gather, we follow and try our best to follow in the way of Jesus. At the table, we hold space for those you're missing. We light our memorial candles and remember those who helped you get ready for school. 
who helped you learn and grow, or a teacher. I wonder who it was that encouraged you to grow into who you are. We hold space for that as we know that teachers and administrators and children and teens are preparing for a new season of school this year. So let that light find you, whatever's happening in your life. Let us worship God together. God have searched me and you know my ways you perfectly understand me it's my cause of praise I cannot escape your presence in air land or sea your arms of love and protection are always with me wonderfully made I will lift my voice to praise you you are God indeed you know me oh God you have made me I am proud I'm the work of your hand in my waking and sleep This path, the gates of holiness are open wide, and on this path, the gates of holiness are open wide, open wide, open wide, open wide, the gates are open wide, so enter in, the gates of holiness are open wide. So enter in, the gates of holiness are open wide, so enter in, the gates of holiness are open wide, open wide, open wide, open wide, the gates are open wide. to my feet, oh God. I know your word, your word is a lamp to my feet, oh God. I know your word is a lamp, oh God, to light my path forever. I know your word is a lamp, oh God, to light my path forever. I know your word, your word is 
raise a lamp to my feet, O oh God. I know your word, your word is a lamp to my feet, O oh God. I know your word is a lamp, O oh God, to light my path forever. I know your word is a lamp, O oh God, to light my path Let's invite this word of scripture to reach to us where we are today. Psalm 19, a Psalm of David. The heavens are telling the glory of God and the firmament proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours forth speech and night to night declares knowledge. There is no speech nor are there words. Their voice is not heard. Yet their voice goes through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. In the heavens he has set a tent for the sun, which comes out like a bridegroom from his wedding canopy, and like a strong man runs its course with joy. Its rising is from the end of the heavens, and its circuit to the end of them, and nothing is hid from its heat. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The decrees of the Lord are sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is clear, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The ordinances of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned. In keeping them, there is great reward. But who can detect their errors? Clear me from hidden faults. Keep back your servant also from the insolent. Do not let them have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Thanks be to God. Let the words of my mouth, those few words were a key in this community, a signpost, a sign to settle in, to get ready in order to encounter the word through the sermon. And those words have been passed to us from the psalmist. And today they remind us that sometimes we need some time to get ready before we listen well. In the circle of children in godly play, each child is welcomed by name into the circle and they're asked if they're ready to hear a story. And if they're not, they can stay with the doorkeeper and sit and when they're ready to enter the circle, it's their choice. So I hope that right now you can do what you need to get ready. Perhaps it's sitting down, perhaps it's putting down something that's distracting you in order to listen. For we have, for the past 52 weeks, been walking a road together. And as we transition in this thin place, this holiday weekend, this transition into fall, as we step across that threshold, we're stepping into the story of the church. We're asking ourselves, 
who am I in this story? And who are we to be? Who's God calling us to be in this next season? I pray that this story, the most recent story from the Godly Play Foundation called The Church, will invite us into wonder. This is the Godly Play story of The Church. When we use this as our work in godly play, we ask for help because it's very heavy. And we have to be careful that the towers don't fall down. This is the table for Holy Communion. Sometimes it's called an altar, and sometimes it's called a table. I wonder where the table goes in the church. I wonder where the table is in our church. There are lots of kinds of churches. Sometimes people see a church that looks like this and they think this is what a church should look like. But this is just one shape in a long story of holy places. There was a time when churches did not have tall towers. These churches were built with high walls and a high and long roof overhead. They had long windows. And do you see the round windows? on the ends. Churches built like this needed to have special supports on the sides to hold up the high walls. But watch. There was a time when churches had solid walls with tiny windows. And inside, they had to have lots of pillars to hold up the heavy stone roofs. When people looked up in a church like this, the roof would have been very low over their heads. I wonder what that would feel like. There was a time when churches were not shaped like crosses. They were long and narrow. 
You kind of have to pretend that there are walls here. These churches were called basilicas. And the bishop would sit in this rounded part to teach. And that is where the table would have been also. But there was a time when churches were not long. There was a time when churches were just little round buildings with the table for the holy bread and the holy wine in the center. I wonder, I wonder what came before the little round churches. There was a time when people met in secret in their homes or on a hillside or a cave or even underground in the catacombs beneath the city of Rome. And then There was nothing. You see, in the year 70 CE, the Roman emperor burned the temple and destroyed the city of Jerusalem. Most of the people who had lived there were killed. It was an awful time. The Romans were after both the Jews and the new Christians who were followers of Jesus because they would not worship the Roman gods. If you go to the city of Jerusalem today, you can still see broken stones and burned out doorways. There was Nothing except brokenness and a deep, scary silence. What were the people going to do? How were they going to worship? They had no temple. They had no plan for their worship. There were no priests. What would the new shape of worship be? The temple and the tabernacle before it had been like boxes inside of boxes. But what should the new shape be? the Jewish people began to meet in their homes to celebrate the Sabbath and to mark the Passover. Christians, too, met in homes where they shared the bread and the wine and they remembered the stories of Jesus. They also collected money to give to the poor and those in need. And then, do you know what happened? The Emperor Constantine passed a law that said that it was okay to be Christian again. And so people could meet again 
without being afraid. They could tell the stories of Jesus. They could read the letters of Paul. They could sing the psalms and hear the prayers and all the stories they had known for so long. People began to leave their own communities of faith and to make pilgrimages to holy places where holy things had happened or maybe where holy people like the martyrs who were killed for their faith were buried. When they went to these places, they began to create little shrines to hold what was holy there. And sometimes there would be a table for the bread and the wine. Then the emperor Constantine gave the Christians some old law buildings. These buildings were long and narrow and they had heavy stone roofs so they needed pillars to hold up the heavy roofs. The people would still make little pilgrimages as they had made to Jerusalem and to other holy places, this time to receive the bread and the wine. The bishop would sit in the curved part to teach and to say the prayers. When Christians were able to build their own churches, they made them in the shape of a cross. They were built like fortresses because the people wanted to feel safe again as they worshipped. People worshipped in buildings like this for hundreds of years. And then they decided they wanted the buildings to be tall and high, something to match the bigness of God. By now there were priests. And when the bishop wasn't there, the priest would read the scriptures and pray. The people would still come and make their little pilgrimage to the table to receive the bread and the wine. When they did baptisms, they didn't have to go to a lake or to a river anymore as Jesus had been baptized, but they would have a stone basin inside of the church that they would fill with water.
they built these lofty crosses to remind them of the bigness of God and to bring the bigness of God inside of them. They still made their little pilgrimage to the table for the holy bread and the holy wine. But then, after about 1,500 years, something's changed inside the church. The place where the short part and the long part met is called the crossing. And in the church in Geneva, where John Calvin was, the table and the preaching place were placed in the crossing. And the elders of the church went to the people with the bread and the wine. If you go to the church in Geneva, you can still see a chair where John Calvin sat to preach and to see the people who were gathered round. Then the people decided they wanted to build tall towers outside of the church so that when people went inside to pray, to learn, they would look up and they would know that God is even bigger than any building could be. Now I wonder, I wonder what part of this story you like the best. I wonder what part of this story is the most important part. I wonder if there's any part of this story we could leave out and still have all the story we need. I wonder where you are in this story. What part of this story feels like you feel in church? I wonder what we really need to have church. I wonder what your work will be today. I wonder what the work of Islington United Church is as we think about what we really need to have church. Amen. children pray Lord send your spirit in this place Lord listen to your children pray send us love send us power send us Listen to your 
So our journey in the story of creation, the adventure of Jesus and the global uprising of the Spirit has come full circle, has brought us back to this table, this table that invites us to the bigness of God, whether it's inside the cathedral or in the cathedral of creation the smells of creation, the beauty and the color, they call us to the bigness of this story. And when we hold a loaf of bread or we pour some wine, we are aware that that story goes all the way back to the seed before the harvest is the growing and the elements in the soil and the wind and the sunshine and the rain. So through the storm of life, we find ourselves at this table. The work of the people of God begins and ends with an invitation. And we remember that Jesus' life was an invitation. So many times along the way, he was asking people to follow him, asking him to leave some things behind so that they could follow and offering up stories and glimpses of the kingdom of God so that they would know it was worth it. Not that it was deserved or earned, but that it was for all who chose. So when we come to this table, we remember that group of friends that asked him questions over and over and didn't quite understand, but knew that if they came close to him, that they could live in a different way. He taught those disciples to pray and to serve, and he sent them out without much. But he sent them out in hope. And at this table, we can taste that story. We remember that last night when he was with his friends who thought the story was heading in a different direction. When it turned back to the city of Jerusalem, they found themselves in an upper room. They had made their road by walking together, and they couldn't have imagined that what would happen next. He took that bread as he had done so many times before. He blessed it and he broke it. He shared it with them. He said, this is my body broken for you. Every time you eat this, remember me. And then he took a cup as he had so many times before and he poured it. He blessed it. He knew there was enough for all. He said, this is my lifeblood poured out for you as you seek aliveness. This is the cup that will bless others. Every time you drink it, remember me. He invited them to pray. He invited them to go with him even that night. Some stayed, some ran, some prayed. All were unsure about how this mystery would play out. And in the ending, there was a beginning. And in the death, there was a resurrection. And in the dying, there was an invitation to new life for all not just the closest disciples, but all who had come close to him and his story. This way of love, this way that invited the Spirit of God to be in these gifts, in the promise that Christ has died and Christ is risen and Christ will come again. The Spirit is present to us in those words and in this action that this may be a visible sign of God's invisible grace. This table 
on this day, your table, wherever you are. Not in just this meal, but in meals to come. This table also invites us into the bigness of prayers for the world, into the awareness of our place in the world, of our privilege and our gratitude, of our struggle and our joy, and how in our heartbeat that connects us to others, in our family, in our community, and in the heartbreak when we hear about nations and cities and hurricanes and places of drought. We hold space for the bigness of God and the healing power of the risen one to bring hope in the midst of death. And so we come to this table trying to be the church, knowing there's so much in that about being human, our flaws and our foibles, the things said and the things unsaid, the goodness and the joy and the authenticity and the invitation to forgiveness and the practice of passing the peace. Perhaps this morning, before you come to this table, it's the peace you need for yourself or the peace of a relationship with another, an unfinished conversation, or just a place that feels like it could use a healing balm. And the bigness of that peace that extends to hospital rooms, to inner struggles, to places where frontline workers are offering care when they're most afraid. For all of us, what relationships we find ourselves in, this meal matters. This relationship with the God who is the beginning and the end, the Alpha and the Omega, it is here for us. So may the taste of this meal reach to Haiti, to Afghanistan, to the conflicts in our own communities and our own lives that seem unresolvable praying that the light be present in the impossible. And may we do it praying with those around the world who pray the prayer Jesus taught his disciples to pray. The Lord's Prayer. May it invite us to this daily bread. The bread of life. the cup of blessing. In the taste of this meal, may the saying of the Lord's Prayer taste and feel differently today as we pray it together now. Our Father who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. When we eat at this table, we receive a gift. And the invitation to offer ourselves to the work of the church and to connect to the wider church is always there. I invite you to hear this story now as the offering is received, the offering that makes a difference in our community and the wider world. Thank you for being part of this action of generosity. After I graduated from Emmanuel College, I, wa I walked from Emmanuel College uh, up to Barrie where we had our ordination uh, ceremonies. It was 225 kilometers, it took me two weeks and it was an amazing uh, journey of self-reflection and self-discovery. 
My name is Reverend Jason Myers. I'm the Minister for Congregational Care here at Metropolitan United Church. I'm a dad, I'm a husband, and I'm a pilgrim. I could no longer set off my call to ministry after our first son Isaiah was born. And in the preparation for his baptism, our minister had me write a letter to him that he would open later in his life. And in that letter, I was saying things like, Isaiah, I want you to follow what God has intended for you. And I realized that I wasn't doing that for myself. The next day, I walked to Emmanuel College to see what this whole ministry thing was about. Something that surprised me now that I've been in the ministry for about a year and a half is I've been surprised at my own capacity to love. I thought that when my kids were, were born, that was, that was kind of the size that my heart would be, but I've come to love this place and these people and the vocation of ministry, and it has been expansive and beautiful. And I'm so thankful that the person of Jesus reached into my life and invited me on this journey with him. What I would say to the donors of the Mission and Service Fund is that it's worth it. The church is alive and beautiful and vibrant and it's worth investing in. And so I would just thank them for their support. His 
faithful follower I will be, for by his hand he leadeth me. And isn't that the invitation, friends, as we step into a new season, as we continue to make the road by walking, but follow in a path that sets us on a new course with a new theme? Well, it's connected to the former one. The invitation is really to be looking for the signposts, and we're curious what they will be along the way in this next year ahead. We know also that some are celebrating another trip around the sun this morning, and so we say happy birthday to Catherine Chip Wells today, and Lori Beth Page on Monday, and Presley McNeil Aitchison on Tuesday, and on Wednesday, Lynn Formella and Jim Johnson and Wendy Sexsmith, and on Thursday, Ann Gallo, and Carol Bennett and Bill Taylor share a birthday on Saturday. So we hold space for them and others that you're marking celebrations and finding ways to be safely navigating changes in life. There's also a few things starting up slowly and gently here at Islington. Meditation will continue online, but soon we're working our way into the gentle ways that we can reopen safely. Next Sunday, we'll have two baptisms in the live stream, and also it will be our first godly play outside at 9.30 in the playground uh, with Cynthia, and they will have their backpacks blessed, and then there's an invitation for you instead of coffee hour or Facebook Live to get in your car and to come and receive a blessing, be it for your backpack or just for you for the season ahead. So come and drive through our circle, and we'll be there to bless you. And if you've been reading, September 14th is Islington Reads, 7 o'clock, Michael Crummy will be here to talk about his book, The Innocents. And lastly, don't forget the need we feel every time Peter sings is for our young ones to have that chance again. And so the Islington Children's Chorus will launch on September 30th. And so if there are young ones in your life, we invite you to share that information that's on our website and has been distributed lately. If there's any other information you need to know, it's at www.islingtonunited.org. But for now, be gentle with yourself. Hold space as we walk together into this next season. The season of creation calls to us with awe. the 
But Jesus knew his holiness And he became the rock Walk with me I will walk with you And build the land that God has planned Where love shines Young Mary Magdalene was sure her life could be much more, and by her faith she dared to let God's love unlock the door. Walk with me, I will walk with you. And You don't even need to take a step to be surrounded by the unconditional love of God, but you are invited to follow in the way of the one who risked for love, who calls us to the work that brings struggle and joy together. And know that the Spirit strengthens you with each breath, each day. Go in peace. Amen.